So hi everyone and welcome to this um, uh, Electoral Integrity Project uh, conference session called Deterring and Detecting Election Fraud. And we're going to have five presentations. So we do have to be mindful of the time. I'm going to be giving the presenters some cues as to how much time they have left. And uh, our discussion today is Mano Singh person. And uh, I think we're just gonna, without further ado, just get started with the presentations. First up is uh, Adeleke Adegbami. <laughs> I hope I didn't butcher the name, sorry about that. Uh, presenting research on political parties, elections funding, and uh, governance in Nigeria's Fourth Republic. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, greeting from Nigeria. My name is Adeleke Adegbami, and the title of my paper is Political Parties, Elections Funding, and Governance in Nigeria's Fourth Republic. Um, political party could be seen as a group of people coming together with the utmost goal of contesting election to hold to power in government. In essence, um, political parties are also essential in deciding, regulating, and nominating candidates for various positions to represent them in an election. And funding remains a key to the effective functioning of political party. Therefore, it will be difficult, if not impossible, for political parties to carry out their agenda to the public without funding. In essence, um, adequate funding is is uh, essentiality for the functionality of political party. And when we are talking about funding, as far as Nigeria is concerned, it can be legal uh, or illegal. So the condemnation surrounding the financing of political parties illegal and the hijacking of the party by the money backs politician made the Nigeria government under general uh, Ibrahim Babangida to start funding a uh, political party, partly. Um, after some time, the funding of political party by the Nigeria government uh, was stopped. So, um, since the commencement of Nigeria fought the public, however, um, the parties have fallen under the control of a few rich cliques who offers money to finance the political party and thereby they hijack the political structure because they have power and they continue to determine who gets into the various political positions and offices at every election. So given the importance of political party in advancement of political act activities and governance activities of country, it does call for concern for the political parties to be financed properly. This is because the funding of political party in the country has continued to generate arguments and counter arguments and arouse public condemnation especially on the issue of financing political party and its tendency to compromise electoral process, free and fair election, and how this can hamper good governance. So the objectives of these studies are three. One, to analyze the constitutional provision for political party fundings, and number two, to examine the effects of illicit funding on political party 
on the political system and structure. And of course, the third one is to highlight how illicit funding of political party has impacted good governance in Nigeria. The method adopted for this uh, study is primary and secondary data. The primary data involve the author observation and um, the interview conducted with key informants, which include the academics, journalists, lawyer, human rights activists, businessmen, students, and of course, community leader, which uh, these uh, people were selected based on convenient sampling method. And also, the study was complemented with secondary data gathered from government official documents, Facebook, academics journal, newspaper, and the uh, internet sources. This data that were gathered were analyzed using content analysis. The finding, the, from the first objective, which is constitutional provision for sourcing funds for political parties in Nigeria, in order to affect certain behavior that can hinder political activities, the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has amended and electoral acts provided how political party should be funded. And uh, the penalty for disobeying all these rules and regulations was stipulated in the Constitution. So the power to assess and give directive on campaign financing and scrutinize the sources of political parties' funds was also given to the Independent Electoral Commission. So according to section 225, subsection one and two of the 1999 Nigeria Constitution as amended, every single political party from time to time shall publish a statement of its assets and liability and submit same to the Independent National Commission, along with a detailed annual statement and analysis of the sources of the fund and other assets. In addition to that, the uh, this sub, uh, section 225, subsection 226, wants the political party from possessing fund or other assets outside Nigeria and section 221 of the constitution also states that no association or organization other than a political party shall donate or contribute funding to political party or the election uh, or to contribute to the election expenses so in addition to the above the electoral act 2022 uh, stated that the Electoral Commission has the power to scrutinize the sources of the fund for each of these uh, political party in Nigeria. So according to this document, the limit set for election expenses for various uh, positions are as follows. For the presidential candidates, it's about 5 billion. The governorship, 1 billion. The senatorial candidate and member of the House of Representatives, 100, 100 million and 70 million, respectively. Then the state assembly, 30 million, and the local government chairman and councillor, 30 million and uh, uh, five uh, million in that order. And the maximum amount that can be donated by an individual or other entity is 50 million and so on and so forth. So in spite of continuous contravention of the existing law guiding political party funding, by different political party from time to time, the concerned institution 
that supposed to uh, sanction all these uh, political party for their uh, uh, bad activities or illegal activities remain silent and the uh, appropriate sanction up to this moment has not been taken. So from there, uh, let's see the finding on illicit funding, the effect of illicit funding on political party. On political party, the effect of illicit funding include promotion of godfatherism and money bag uh, politician, hijacking of political party structure by this uh, money bag politician, then the policies of the highest bidder, which means those who have uh, enough money can just come around and involve in political activities of Nigeria and uh, find its way through. Then the policies of exclusion, exclusion in the sense that uh, it's those people that can uh, contribute financially that most of the time included in political activity. Then loyalty to few personality against the generality of the people. So those are people that receive money from the godfathers. They remain loyal to their godfather instead of uh, rendering social services for the people. And the next one is inhibition of a free and fair election. So with illicit funding, the process of election is already compromised and uh, thereby free and fair election most of the time is not guaranteed as far as uh, the country is concerned. And then uh, most of the time, the process promotes unmerited candidates. Uh, that is why we have some of these candidates, they are not prepared. Uh, accidental leaders, and thereby they cannot perform well on getting to the public office. From there, uh, we look at the effects of illicit funding of political party on good governance of Nigeria. So illicit political funding has led to the loss of credibility uh, of democratic governance in Nigeria. No doubt about that. That is why, uh, that is the reason uh, some, the electorates most of the time remain apathy and the, most of them feel unconcerned um, about political activities in Nigeria. And also it has continued to undermine fair representation uh, because most of the people that uh, come to power most of the time, they came through back door and uh, with the assistance of their so-called God uh, Father. And this is taking its toll on democratic uh, building. Then the next one, it's, in, it's in beat the good governance principle vis-a-vis -vis transparency, accountability, and uh, responsiveness to people's needs. It encourages corruption and undue interference in governance uh, activities. It encourages self-serving against serving the generality of the people. And of course, illicit political financing has been a major reason for the underperformance of government and has continued to hinder uh, governance from manifesting, good governance from manifesting in Nigeria. And uh, but in conclusion now, the study concluded that until stringent measures are taken to exterminate the illicit funding of political activities and procuring election through illicit uh, funding, citizen trust in election matters will not be preserved and the election will not be free and fair. And when this happens, it will definitely affect the quality of governance. And uh, thereby, there's no way Nigeria can have good uh, governance. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And um, I think it's best to just move on to the next presentation now straight away and uh, save time for the questions and comments in the end. So Ronan, uh, please, the floor is yours. 
Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Let me see if I can put up the um, the correct PowerPoint. Here we go. And hit this. Now, can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Ronan McDermott, and with my colleagues Hassan and Taha, who are on the Zoom call, um, we've um, we have a paper called uh, "A Game of Forms," and really it alludes to um, what we perceive or question mark the decade of rigged elections. It's really focusing on how the use of forms um, has been at the core of of um, the uh, manipulation of electoral processes. On, on election day itself. The paper uh, talks, um, gives an overview of elections in Pakistan, which I will give you some of, but not, not a huge amount uh, because we have a limited time. Um, but uh, it's important to understand the context. General elections um, take place on one day for both provincial national assembly and provincial assemblies. Quick, a quick look at the voting and results management process. Again, it's elaborated in the paper. Um, we're going to look at 2013, um, 2018, and between the two, there was a period of electoral reform, which we're going to mention briefly. And again, 2024, which is the set of elections um, essentially still ongoing. The post-electoral processes are uh, still working their way. And we're going to draw a thread from, uh, as far as results management, from 13 through to, to 2024. And then a brief discussion internally. Um, and the paper uh, offers more readings. Once we're published, you'll be able to get all the detail. Um, by the title, um, this is Charles Dance, the actor. Um, at least two of the three authors of this paper have never seen an episode of Game of Thrones. Um, but uh, that's that's where the title has come from. And there is uh, a leading actor from uh, showing that even the mighty have to queue up when they wish to uh, if to vote. So that was taken last week uh, during the UK. Um, that's the, so that's the last popular culture reference uh, for the further duration. Um, the management of elections in Pakistan is, is, is run by ECP, the Election Commission of Pakistan. It's a federal, it's a federal federated country. And there are provincial election commissions, but really the power rests at the center. And then at constituency level, there in each constituency, there's a returning officer. And he or she uh, have significant authority with respect to polling schemes and candidate nomination and so on. And their work was largely unsupervised, you know, for, for many, many years. Um, then at the polling station level, there are presiding officers uh, who conduct the polling and, and, and they prepare the, uh, they oversee the counting and they prepare the, uh, the, the results, the, the forms that are the atomic unit of uh, results management. Um, since independence, Pakistan has had, it has 12 general elections since then, uh, but no prime minister has ever completed a five-year term. Um, and there have been four episodes of martial law in the country, so the the, the Pakistani context is 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 uh, quite challenging for the democratic process. Um, results management, well, balloting is relatively conventional. Um, the it's it's a paper balloting process. It's first past the post, um, you know, and there's a voter list. Um, people have to identify themselves when they come to the polling station. They're given the ballot papers. They mark the ballot papers and so on. This is all a highly observed process. There are uh, political party can and candidate agents, as well as uh, civilian uh, citizen observers in polling stations, although not every polling station is covered, uh, but very, very active um, uh, processes there. Um, it is a largely conventional process. Counting is done at the polling station. It's done immediately after the close of polls. So nothing very unusual there. And what this shows, uh, this graph shows, and we'll come back to it, is, is the um, the process by which in pre election the polling scheme is created. Step one, um, that's used as the basis for many systems on election day. Polling happens. And in this case, you see um, the presiding officer prepares a, a form 45 and the results process is essentially a paper process with an overlay of, of technology aimed at bringing, in, in theory, bringing transparency and accountability to the process. So the forms at the polling station, the, the primary one is Form 45, and it's shown here. Um, you see, uh, it, essentially, it is a list of the candidates and um, the number of votes that they got, and these are tallied up. And at the bottom, you see um, valid votes and votes excluded, a pretty normal 
document, but this form, form 45, I'm not showing you, but there's a second form, form 46, which is the um, the reconciliation of ballot papers. But the form 45 is the atomic unit. This is the results of the count from a particular polling station. And this is then prepared. Then this is sent um, to the returning officer at the constituency level. And um, this then leads to a provisional consolidated statement of the results of the count, which is the, the result at a given constituency based on the provisional numbers from those previous Form 45s. So all of these are then totted up and the results for a given um, constituency are included on Form 47. Um, prior to 2013, the process was and remains a paper process. I should point that out that the, the paper forms are the legal instruments. Not, none of the digital, unlike say some confusion in, in in Kenya, for example, where there was some question mark as to what, 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 what was the result. Paper forms are the official results. And all of the all of the electronics and the systems are introduced were ways of 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 it, both providing oversight of the paper process as well as more speedily providing provisional results. Uh, to the centre, but also, in theory, to the outside world. Whereas many returning officers, off their own initiative, were using things like Microsoft Excel, using various bits of technology to help them do the addition, uh, do the mathematics of results consolidation. And there was no overarching technology in use, no overarching system. Each ORO did his or her, her own thing. Um, in 2013, ECP asked uh, at the last minute, they asked the UNDP to prepare um, a results management system at the constituency level, not at the polling station level. And this was created. And it was um, it was used, um, but not in a not in a timely fashion and not in a particularly uh, successful fashion. Nevertheless, it was used. And over the, the days and the weeks following the election, um, the data was put in there, but it certainly didn't, it wasn't, did, didn't feature heavily on the night of those elections. Um, the 2013 elections had widespread irregularities and FAFEN, which is the, the primary um, umbrella body for citizen observation in Pakistan, uh, their report talked about widespread irregularities, including some that were conduced, that created a conducive environment for fraud. So the RMS was, was done at a uh, constituency level, uh, but 90% subsequently of the data did come into that RMS. Um, there, of course, were allegations of rigging. This is a feature. Every, every loser cries foul and every winner says everything was fine. The timeline for the dis for the clearing of um, disposal of electoral petitions in Pakistani law was 60 days. So there were a significant number of petitions uh, submitted in uh, 2013. However, these were just did were not dealt with by the deadline. And the main party who was complaining, PTI, uh, within a year that their, their patients had run out. So there was a very significant level of uh, street protests and civic civic unrest, um, amongst other things. That ended, but the a judicial commission was um, created um, in part as a response to that pressure, and there was an investigation, a very significant report that, on its face, was gave a clean bill of health to the elections. Nevertheless, there were some concerns that they found and raised, and um, in, in a very telling, there's one quote from that in the, in the paper where they say that the, the the PTIs were not unreasonable in their in their petitions in other words that there was there was there was grounds for for questioning um an audit of the forms from the polling station suggested that as many as one in three polling stations there were forms missing so um had the rms been used in a very timely fashion that that deficiency might have become clearer sooner nevertheless um there so so the judicial commission did make some recommendations so in a quick parenthesis, we had in 2017 a very comprehensive electoral reform process, and there was a consolidated electoral law passed. And of most interest to our discussion, this law now mandated the use of results management system, not only um, at the constituency level by the ORO, but also that results would be transmitted by the presiding officer from the polling station. So that's a, a significant, a significant um, additional legal requirement. Um, and it also required the publication of results on the ECP's website. 
in 2018, um, there was a lot of problems, uh, the disqualification of uh, politicians, including the, the um, uh, charging of the then prime minister. There was censorship and crackdowns. A, a familiar pattern is emerging. Accusations of est establishment influence and party defections and so on. So all of the pre-electoral rigging um, that, that, that went on, the elections took place, but this time, because of the legal mandate, there were two. There were two two systems. One being used from the polling station, and that was uh, from the polling station to the constituency. That was developed by Nadra, uh, an agency. What was that number you put up? Sorry, I didn't see it. That's ten, is it? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm getting there. Um, and there was an RMS from then, as before, an RMS from the RO to headquarters. There was no direct link between the two systems. And a reminder that paper was still the binding process. So um, this is the um, the process of the green arrows here, which you may or may not be able to see, depending on where you have uh, here and here, some step two to three and three to five. These were the RTS and the RMS in this process. Um, 85,000 polling stations, uh, 40,000 40, observers. Fafnum reports a significant reduction in irregularities. Uh, EU observer mission gave it a clean bill of health. However, uh, RTS either failed or stopped or slowed down or was sabotaged or was ordered offline. Now, that, all those possibilities are answers that you get depending on who you ask. But RTS did not perform well on the night. Um, RMS did perform well, and but it was late because RTS was late, RMS was late, but... Uh, 36 hours, so two mornings after the election day, 95% of those Form 45s um, had been captured and, um, excuse me, uh, Form 47, excuse me, had been captured and 91% of them were on the website. So the purpose for which it was intended seemed to have an effect um, and there was a transparency and a resulting accountability there. However, the underlying Form 45s took a lot longer to capture and publish, but they were subsequently published. Occam's razor, one of the problems with R RTS was that it simply had been rushed. There hadn't been sufficient training. Um, and But uh, as I said, many reasons for it not being used. Um, 2024, different story. And I rushed to this, but this is current. So you read all about this uh, in the news today. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan lost his, his majority and was ousted. There was a wave of repression against PTI. Despite this, independent candidates polled very strongly and polling itself, actual polling on election day was relatively unhindered, as one report said. Uh, this time, ECB de developed its own um, RMS, election management system, in integrating RTS from polling stations and RMS from uh, returning officers. Now, as, early, as recently as the day before the election, this was touted as being invulnerable to internet outages. So in other words, this system didn't need the internet and it uh, would, would happen in any case. Nevertheless, um, on the night, the internet was blocked as um, the government sought to minimize uh, communication between um, opposition candidates and their supporters. Um, one of our authors was a presiding officer and the timeline here talks about when the Form 45s were prepared, but they were entered into the uh, uh, EMS, but not transmitted because of internet problems. Uh, many hours later, um, the PO arrives at the R, at the returning officer, but there's a queue with 30 minutes. Okay, good, nearly done. And then it wasn't until 0430 that the results are handed over. Um, as the early returns showed a great night for the, the independents, suddenly we start to see the problems emerging and access to the RO count centers are restricted. Manipulation of forms, both 45 and 47, are undertaken. ECP then put some up on the website, but took them down again. Our paper shows, here's a couple of examples, very clear uh, manipulation. You see numbers changing from 173 to 973 here for a party. Here we see um, numbers being increased for a party. In this example, we see um, the number of rejected votes growing enormously and the number of votes received by one party being reduced by that same amount. So there's plenty of documentary evidence to support the, the, the allegation that forms were manipulated. And the, the failure, there's one more example, but the, the paper will detail these for you. The failure of um, the RMS because the internet was locked down, it really calls into question um, 
the use of this technology. And given that it was meant to be immune to internet outage, there are questions to answer. But the evidence is there in the forms. And if the courts prevail and ECP and others are forced to bring those forms into the public domain, that evidence will get um, disclosed. But it was a game of forms, and that's uh, that is the story of the 2024 election and the history of it going back to 2018 and 2013. So thank you for thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. That was perfectly on time. Um, all right, let's not waste any time with me here speaking. I'm not the one you came here to listen to. So I, my understanding is that uh, Ian Batista is here now to present. Uh, his research on compared authorization. The floor is yours if you are here. Thank you, Maria. Yes, I'm here. Sorry, everyone, for not getting the Zoom link on time, but here I am. Uh, let me share my screen. And da -da -da -da. could you please confirm that you're seeing it? Yes, we're seeing it. Amazing. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. I'm Ian Batista. I got a PhD in political science from the Federal University of Pernambuco, Brazil, early this year. Uh, I've been a research assistant and project assistant at the CAR Center for the last few years. And in the 2024 cohort, I'm an EIP junior fellow. That's the research agenda I've been working on uh, during this fellowship. And I've started uh, working on this agenda in my PhD dissertation. So I'll have something to, to show you from, from that work. Um, from my fellow fellows who are here in this Zoom call, I don't, in terms of uh, presentation structure, I don't have necessarily uh, new additions to, to present you today, but uh, by the end, I'll tell everyone uh, the exact stage I'm in in this research agenda, what I've been considering and doing uh, in this work. So um, I've I, I I create interest in this research in this agenda based on two related phenomena. Uh, in one side, uh, in the global in the global crisis of democracy literature, I've been interested in the issue of democratic backsliding. Uh, it can be uh, broadly understood as multiple formal and informal incremental actions perpetrated by democratic elected leaders aiming to undermine a democratic institutional safeguards uh, like the separation of powers, civil, liber civil rights and liberties, and the uncertainty of a fair electoral process. I believe that by definition, this process, this phenomena is multifaceted, gradual, uh, potentially aiming uh, to undermine more than one uh, democratic fundamental aspect at the same time. In the left figure, uh, that's uh, I'm, I, I took it from my dissertation and based on uh, you know a possible measure for democratic backsliding, uh, I'm I'm finding that in the last two decades, uh, it's increasing the number of countries that can be consider going through a process of democratic backsliding. Just for you to know here, I'm using a five-year running average uh, degradation of the VDEMS Liberal Democracy Index of 0.05. So 5% 5 of the index uh, regressed, uh, degraded in you know an average time uh, uh, duration of a, a, a presidential term. So if in five years a country went through a process of 5% of degradation of the liberal democracy index, then I'm considering for the sake of this figure that the country is going through democratic backsliding. And by this measure, we can see that uh, the number of countries going through uh, democratic backsliding is increasing in the last two decades. On the other hand, uh, I'm also very interested in the increasing number of countries that can be considered as electoral autocracies since the end of the Cold War. By definition, in these regimes, uh, regular elections are held for executive and legislative offices, but, but these elections are not necessarily clean. Competition among candidates is not fair, and the population is not free to choose their preferred options. 
uh, different from a closed autocracy, a full dictatorship. In these regimes, there is tolerance for multi-party system, more or less free media, uh, some freedom for civil society organizations, but in the same time, different from a full democracy, uh, liberties and rights are not necessarily guaranteed, pluralism is limited, and the opposition is often harassed. Uh, I understand that these two phenomena, democratic backsliding, uh, a process of electoral degradation by democratic elected leaders, and uh, the regime considered as an electoral autocracy, these two phenomena might be related. And in this process, something is going on with elections, the way the elections are held in these countries. And this is my research interest. My, my research interest. What happens to elections once a democratic elected leader engage in the process of electoral uh, autocratization, let's put it that way, like giving a spoiler on where I am right now uh, on this research. And uh, I consider broadly two ways of a leader to subvert electoral qualities and that will uh, ultimately uh, make this regime transition from democracy to electoral autocratization. In one hand, you have what Nahib Bukele is doing in El Salvador, uh, renewing all members of the Supreme Court, uh, running for re-election when the Constitution clearly prohibits it, and redistricting uh, the electoral districts of the whole country. That's what I'm calling uh, a process much more related to the concept of democratic backsliding that uh, perhaps we are all already uh, uh, used to it. On the other hand, a president can do what uh, Peter Mutarika did in Malawi in 2019 uh, on the election day, uh, implement tactics and strategies of vote day uh, fraud. Uh, this election in Malawi 2019 uh, is known as the TPAX election because uh, they used TPAX corrective fluid to change voting results at the polling center level. So uh, uh, you can either uh, uh, subvert electoral uh, rules before election day and create an uneven condition for competition, or you can resort to vote day tactics. And these are the two broad categories that I've been working on uh, so far. Uh, to investigate empirically this phenomenon, I I first used the regimes of the word uh, categorization from VDEM. Uh, there is a, a clear category there called electoral autocracy. Uh, and from the period I'm studying, 1990 to 2021, uh, if a country was at one point considered a democracy, but then in the following year uh, was considered an electoral autocracy, then I identified a regime transition that I'm interested in. Then I exclude cases of coup d'etat, using data from the coup d'etat project, because I'm interested in the process of subverting of the regime during regular times, excluding them abrupt uh, and illegal takeovers of power. I also exclude cases that were not democracy uh, for two years or less before the uh, such identified transition. Uh, and then a few other cases that once I I got to study them uh, uh, in, in more detail, I understood that those transitions were too generous and were not necessarily telling me the story I'm interested in study. In the end, I, I first identified, excluding cases of coup d'etat, 44 cases of such transitions from 1990 to 2021. But then after I've studied all these cases, I, I got to the to the sample of 35 cases that are actually telling the story of a democratic elected leader who implement uh, uh, strategies to make the elections not free and fair, and then these regimes as, are considered electoral autocracies. Uh, I then uh, I, I enacted a qualitative analysis of these 35 cases. Uh, you can actually see the analysis of these 35 cases in the Shiny app that I've developed for my dissertation. You will find uh, the leader responsible for such transition and everything I could find uh, that this leader has implemented to subvert uh, electoral qualities uh, on these cases. Uh, 
I understand that several steps in my research so far are perhaps uh, too uh, judgment call, let's put it that way. And then I'm trying to compensate this with transparency, providing all cases uh, and what I could find about them. For each case, I've tried to code specific measures implemented by these leaders that impacted a specific part of the electoral cycle. I'm considered the current center uh, understanding of the electoral cycle. I, am, I understand that there is a, some organizations will have different categories for electoral cycle. I'm using the current centers. Um, and then each measure I've coded, I've related to uh, impacting uh, a part of the electoral cycle, but sometimes more than one part of the electoral cycle. For example, a measure could at the same time uh, impact the legal framework, but also media, for example. Uh, and then after studying and coding the measures, I, I, I coded and categorized each, de each transition case as through democratic backsliding, when the reforms have impl are implemented before election day, or fraudulent elections when uh, uh, leaders resort to vote day tactics. These you are... How... Okay, okay. Uh, these are how the cases are divided among the two categories. Interesting here, even though democratic backsliding is a concept that's been more uh, discussed recently, it's possible to find what the literature understands as democratic backsliding going on in countries during the 90s already. Uh, these are how the all the measures that I've coded. I I think individually are uh, sixty nine measures in in general, but again, one measure can be coded in uh, related to more than one part of the electoral cycle. These are how the measures are divided among the two categories. Uh, I've tried to run uh, simple uh, descriptive statistics trying to understand how the two categories can be different from each other. For example, I've tried to run t-tests to understand if particular, uh, uh, for example, the amount of years until transition. So from the, the year that leader took power and the year of the identified transition, does this time frame vary between the two uh, groups? Uh, no, 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 no rel statistical uh, relevant uh, finding here. Uh, neither for democratic history before transition, so for how long uninterruptedly a country was dem a dem considered a democracy, and also even though we can spot some uh, differences between the two groups, statistically, uh, this doesn't sound uh, um, irrelevant. Except for uh, a Fisher exact test that I've run, uh, which is similar to a, a, a chi-square, but by well, but on these tasks, we calculate the exact distribution of probabilities rather than the approximation of the distribution. And here, what I found is that measures aimed or related to the uh, candidatures and campaigning part of the cycle are much more common uh, in process of democratic backsliding uh, rather than on cases of fraudulent elections. On the other hand, EJ tactics. I mean, measures that are related to parts of the electoral cycle on the voting day or after are much more common in cases of fraudulent election than the cases of democratic backsliding. What I'm finding here is that apparently, uh, if the leader has, has implemented measures that created an even condition for competition, this leader probably won't resort to vote day tactics. And this is kind of in line with the literature that already says that uh, E-day tactics and strategies of fraud are much more riskier for leaders that are implementing them. And once you've already created an even conditions of competition, you don't need to resort to these sort of tactics. Right now in this agenda, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if it's worth pursuing uh, the, the 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 consideration of a concept that could be called compared electoral autocratization, as I'm trying to document measures that are autocratizing regimes by creating less 
uh, uh, elections with less integrity. So I'm not sure if that's a, a worth pursuing path. Um, right now what I have, and I understand that, it's a lot of descriptions. So I'll be open to, 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 to hear possible recommendations of journals that will be interested in this sort of study. Uh, and more recently, I've started to explore the democratic erosion events data set, which compiles events for several cases across the world, not necessarily countries that only uh, 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 actually transition to electoral tokenization by any, any uh, categorization. And I'm finding much more uh, uh, measures related to the 35 cases that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to use this data, uh, possibly combine with the data that I have, and then provide you know even more robust descriptions of these uh, cases. And the last time I've presented this research, I've been getting a lot of feedback on to implement uh, a KCA approach, which will fit the data that I have right now. So just for you to know that this is something that I'm considering. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, and looking forward to hear what you're thinking of it. Thank you so much, Ian. <clears throat> also perfect uh, timing. So next we have um, a paper on aggregation fraud. Do we have Guy Grossman, Miguel Rueda, or Chuninge here to present? Yes, excellent. Uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. And we can see the screen. Can you say something to make sure we can hear you? Yes. Uh, Great. Give Excellent. me one sec, because I'm having some issue here with my mm -hmm. other screen. Uh, there you go. Uh, all right. Thanks, thanks everyone for being for being here, uh, Toby and the other organizers, uh, Maria. Uh, so this this paper has been some years in the making, um, but Chuni and Guy and myself like we think that this is a great audience to to share some of the results that we have so far. Um, all right. Uh, first, let me put this in full screen. There you go. Um, so we are all very familiar with the negative consequences of electoral fraud. Uh, we know that it might take away incentives of politicians to do what voters want. Uh, it might uh, reduce the possibility of different groups to have some representation in government. Uh, it could lead to violence uh, and potentially to civil war. And we've also know that there are many different ways to engage in electoral fraud. Uh, the type of electoral manipulation that we're going to be focusing on here is aggregation fraud, right? And by aggregation fraud, we mean the manipulation in the collecting and adding vote totals after the ballots have been cast, right? So that's going to be our main uh, uh, type of uh, electoral manipulation that we're going to be focusing on. So given that we know these bad consequences, the natural question is, how can we stop this, right? And one common answer, uh, usually expressed by international organizations and monitoring agencies, is let's publish disaggregated so results at the polling station level are great. Um, and the logic is sound, and I, I will go over the logic in a little bit, but uh, what we find is that the in a prior systematic empirical evidence uh, of how changes in how uh, voting reporting practices affect, end up affecting uh, aggregation fraud. So, so that's our main object paper, which is to verify that this sound logic uh, is, is, there is backing it up. Um, so what is it that we do in this paper? So we do things. Uh, first, we introduce a new data set that includes the granularity of electoral results. So basically, what we have is the lowest aggregation level of Polish electoral results, where the country is given the results at the polling station level, at the constituency level, or at the national level. And this is uh, results that are published online on official sources. Uh, I'll give more details of the data. Once we have this... Um, this uh, uh, information, what we do is to verify 
that indeed there is some uh, correlation between the level of granularity of these results and aggregation fraud indicators. Um, so as I was saying, like the intuition for why disaggregated results prevent aggregation fraud is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you give access uh, to voters of these results at the very disaggregated level, they could verify on their own that the vote totals that determine the winner are correct, right? Uh, so if that's the case, there should be a negative relationship between the granularity of Polish electoral results and indicators of aggregation irregularities. So that's the first hypothesis that we're gonna test with our data. Um, one concern that you could have is that corrupt leaders, as it becomes harder for them to implement aggregation fraud with more disaggregated results, they're gonna switch to other tactics. Like they might not incur in aggregation fraud anymore, but they might engage more in vote buying or in um, electoral violence pre-election or registration irregularities. So there is that concern of substitution and this is something that, that we also wanna test. So if there is substitution, there should be a positive relationship between granularity of Polish electoral results and other forms of electoral irregularities, as I mentioned, like electoral violence, clientelism, uh, registration irregularities, things that happened before the election, right before the election. All right, um, so now I drive the data a little bit. So what we do is, so our data covers 123 low and middle income countries from the period from 2000 to 2020. The main variables in this data set are the lowest aggregated level of electoral results published by official sources online, um, the number of the units which the most disaggregated results are published. So if it's polling stations, it's the number of polling stations. If it's constituencies, the number of constituencies, uh, and the average size in terms of valid votes of these units, right? Um, as I mentioned, like we only use official online sources to extract this information, and we did the data collection in the year 2021 and half of 2022. Um, so, you know, it could that, let's say, Wikipedia publishes some results and they cite as a source an official source. We don't take that. Like, we go to the Ministry of Interior website, and if it's not there, you know, uh, or if it's different from what is in Wikipedia or in other places in online, then we record what we find online in these official sources. And I'm happy to answer questions as to why we do that uh, later on. Um, we see in the data is great variation in this level of granularity. So here to give you an example, this world map, uh, we have the last period in our data set from 2015 to 2020. And what we see is that the darker colors, they indicate more granularity. Um, so Latin America tends to have more disaggregated results than let's say Africa, although there are some, some exceptions, like these are averages for those, for those years. Um, we also see variation across time. So over time, the level of disaggregation of Polish electoral results has been increasing, um, which is what, what this uh, figure here shows. You might not be able to see very well, uh, but, but that's the pattern. Um, in this uh, figure, we check the raw correlation between the two main variables of analysis. So in the y-axis, we have an indicator from BLEM, which is the other voting is So this indicator includes presence of country experts of things like ballot stuffing, misreporting of votes, and false votes. And on the x-axis, we have the number of units at which disaggregated, at the most disaggregated results are published per capita. Um, we're actually divided by adult population, like normalizing it by that. But um, anyway, so like what we see, uh, there is, seems to be a negative uh, relationship between these two variables, which is what, what we will uh, expect. Now in the rest of the paper, what we do is trying to rule out the possibility that confounders uh, are explaining this, this relationship. So 
our empirical strategy is very simple. Like we're adopting a selection on observables approach. So we're going to try to account for all potential common determinants of granularity and aggregation fraud that we can get a hold of. Um, so this is the list of trolls. I, I'm not going to have time to, to go uh, on the reasons why we should include this. But if anyone is interested, uh, we can talk about that later. Importantly for this specification, uh, well, first of all, like the unit of analysis here is the country election type period. So one row in our data set will be, for example, Colombia, pre executive uh, 2015 well, or 2015 to 2020. So that will be uh, the unit of observation. So what that allows us to do is to include country election type intercepts. So basically what this means is we're going to compare this, the uh, aggregation fraud of the same country, the same type of elections, over time as granularity changes. Uh, and we're allowing the, the errors to, of the same country to be correlated uh, by clustering at the country level. All right, so let me show you like, the, main, the main result. Um, so this table is giving us the coefficient on granularity in models that have as dependent variable other voting irregularities by VDEM and an indicator of unfair count by the PEI. Uh, so there are several different measures of granularity. Uh, let's just focus on the column number three. So this coefficient means that an increase in reporting granularity that is larger than one standard deviation is associated with a reduction of perceptions of irregularity of 0.21, which is 56% of the mean of that index, which we think is, is, is pretty big. Um, so this negative relation is very robust to specifications and to a number of, of checks that we do in the paper that I'll very briefly mention uh, towards the end. The next question is, is there substitution? So this is a similar table, but instead of aggregation fraud, we have other forms of irregularities like intimidation to opposition, uh, violence against civilians, clientelism, registry irregularities. And the main takeaway from this slide is that there is no positive coefficient. So we don't, we're not finding any uh, strong uh, evidence that suggests that uh, granularity is going to increase uh, the use of other forms of manipulation that don't involve uh, collecting votes or aggregating votes, right? Uh, after vote taking place. Uh, you see like there are some negative coefficients here that, that are significant, although I, I, I need, we need to say that, that this significance is not as robust as the first result that we have. Like the, 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 the the least we can say here is that, that the coefficients are not positive uh, and significant. Um, we also wanted to check what's the relationship of granularity with voters' perceptions and monitors and experts' perceptions of the overall quality of, of elections. And we find uh, also a robust negative relationship between granularity and perceptions of uh, bad elections. Uh, in general, uh, and this is what, what we're showing here. Uh, monitors, however, and the public, and I'm not showing the, the, the results that use the barometers data, don't have that um, significant relationship, um, although all the coefficients are, are negative, like they, they're not precisely estimated. All right. So one concern that you might have is, well, like you find that negative association between granularity and aggregation fraud, but the indicators are uh, perceptions of experts, right? So who knows if those perceptions of experts are actually tied to things uh, that happen in the ground. Um, so we think that there are two observable implications in the case that in fact there are actual changes in behavior from the leaders. Like the first one is that that it should also affect the timing of the announcement of, of results. So in order to engage in aggregation fraud, usually you need time and there are delays 
uh, when you publish the, the results. So what we find is that in places with more granularity, there are less delays in the announcements of the election results. The second thing that we did, thank you, Maria, uh, is to check the relationship between granularity and the incumbent's party voucher, right? Uh, we did this, however, uh, for presidential elections, and we do find a net relationship between that. Like, I apologize with Manu, like, uh, the version that she read, uh, it doesn't, didn't have these results. It just came out of the, of the oven. Um, but anyway, so there is a, a negative relationship uh, with the incumbent party voucher, which we think suggests that there is something going on besides just changes in perceptions of the experts that may know that granularity has changed. Um, these results are robust to the inclusion of period effects, which takes, uh, yeah, which rule out uh, the possibility that, that the results are driven by just improvements in quality of elections and granularity over time. Uh, we have different alternative definitions of granularity. Besides the three that I show you, uh, there are two more in the paper. And we also use, when available, alternative measures outcomes. And, and the results are pretty, pretty consistent. So very quickly, uh, just to summarize uh, the talk, we're introducing a data set that contains the level at which national electoral results are published online if in a period, in the period from 2000 to 2020, for 123 low and middle income countries. Uh, we test where there is a link between granularity of Polish electoral results and indicators of electoral malfeasance. The main finding is that there is a very robust negative correlation, partial correlation between granularity of Polish electoral results and aggregation irregularities, right? On the other hand, we don't seem to find clear uh, evidence of substitution to other forms of, of electoral manipulation. So um, my time is up. And uh, so thanks uh, very much. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And we have one last paper, last but not least, uh, Cole Harvey, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you all. Uh, as I get this pulled up, um, I have to make two short announcements. One is this is a different paper than is listed in the official program. Uh, that is because I got some comments on that paper and decided to split the American specific portion of it apart from the comparative portion. And so what I'm presenting today is the more comparative portion. So with apologies to anyone who tuned in specifically to, to learn about the US 2020 election. Uh, also, I'm recovering from a cold. So you may hear some hacking and coughing and I apologize in advance. Uh, all right, so put this into full screen mode, uh, and hopefully you can all see this. Yes. <clears throat> all right, so uh, the research question here uh, investigates the relationship between election manipulation and protest, uh, post-election protest, which is, of course, a uh, central feature of a lot of theories of uh, deterrence of election manipulation, and uh, complicates it a little bit by introducing uh, some thoughts about how polarization might influence those kinds of behaviors. Uh, so the context of this is that uh, we've researchers have identified over the past few years uh, autocratization, de-democratization, democratic backsliding um, in a secular way. Lots of countries around the world. Uh, most recently, 2024, uh, 42 countries uh, were moving in this direction, in the authoritarian direction, according to VDEM. Uh, and political polarization has been identified as a possible cause of this, uh, as we'll talk about more in a few minutes. This is largely in the in the literature uh, feature of voters proactively choosing anti-democratic candidates in order to prevent their opponents from taking power. That's how it's often framed in the literature on polarization. But of course, election integrity, as, as we all know, is a central pillar of democratic governance, and it's less investigated in the literature. Um, this question of how does polarization affect election integrity itself. And so that's where this paper comes in. Uh, I look at data on around 1,500 election periods 
in uh, 149 countries between 1990 and 2012. Uh, the key finding is that polarization does indeed undermine election integrity. Uh, and one of the mechanisms for doing so is a bit counterintuitive, perhaps. Uh, it, by making post-election protest more likely, even when elections are clean, it sort of breaks the possible deterrent mechanism of uh, post-election protest on manipulation uh, and reduces, kind of minimizes one of those guardrails that many scholars have um, have assumed or built into their theories. All right, so uh, to dig in a little bit deeper, uh, again, as many of us know, uh, election manipulation has been understood to have a variety of benefits for uh, incumbents. Of course, it improves the likelihood of winning. That's the most basic one. It can also send signals of dominance uh, in one way or another, depending on, on which scholars are writing about it. But this is, of course, Alberto Simpson's view. Uh, it can attract talented politicians into the party that has that advantage. Uh, it can be a tool for recruiting effective clients who can deliver votes. Uh, but it, of course, also comes with costs. Now, these may be organizational, financial, resources, time, energy, and so on. Uh, but researchers are often more interested in this question of legitimacy costs, that when an election is manipulated, that citizens and voters respond to this negatively, they cooperate less with the government, uh, and in particular, uh, most commonly in the research, in the literature, we think about uh, post-election protest as the biggest example of uh, this legitimacy cost to the government of engaging in election manipulation. <clears throat> now, there, well, let me say one more thing back on this. The, to tie that together, many scholars have argued that uh, because of that cost, that risk of potential post-election protest, incumbents may be wary of or even deterred from engaging in election manipulation. So this is the deterrent uh, mechanism of protest on election manipulation. Now, there is some mixed evidence for this, though. Uh, so first of all, we know that election manipulation is widespread. Uh, protest is quite rare. Uh, it, it, we see, of course, it often in the media. But if we think about elections generally, if we look at it statistical analysis, it's not very common. And when we do this kind of statistical analysis, different research designs have found different results. So some authors have found no significant relationship between election manipulation and protest. Some have found the expected positive relationship. Some have found a negative relationship. Uh, in a paper of mine and a co-author from a few years ago, we find that the relationship that you observe depends on what kinds of manipulation are most prominent in the particular election. So we have a, a mixed picture. So then if protest is indeed a deterrent to election manipulation, as many of us have theorized, why do we see this mixed record? And put another way, why do incumbents engage in manipulation in places where protest is kind of likely a priori, where the opposition is large or popular or well-organized, uh, well-financed, and so on? <clears throat> this brings us to uh, polarization, which will be uh, my answer to this question. Uh, so again, there is a growing literature on the dangers of political polarization to democratic governance. Uh, in particular, the argument has been that by making people associate more with their in-group and dislike and distrust the out-group more, it inclines them to support anti-democratic politicians more, uh, even if they like democratic values, even if they genuinely support uh, democracy and rule of law and so on. Uh, they may dislike the other side so much and fear them taking power so much that they are willing to endorse uh, undemocratic behaviors by their politicians from their own in-group to prevent that bad outcome. Uh, so that's the focus largely in the literature so far. Um, I'm going to turn this and focus it a little bit more directly on this question of the deterrent mechanism uh, and election manipulation. So two effects of polarization on election manipulation, in my view, in this paper. Uh, well, one, first of all, it should make uh, incumbents more interested in manipulation. If, if the incumbent represents one of these polarized groups and similarly fears a takeover by the other side in a democratic election, they may have a stronger strategic incentive to engage in election manipulation based on the cost to them of losing power. And we could think about that as in ideological terms in uh, the fear that they may be repressed if the other side takes over, or in purely affective polarization terms, disliking the other side. However, and this is the key point, the novel point, uh, I think, uh, it also increases, polarization does, increases the likelihood that the losers in an election will engage in protest even if the loss is clean. Uh, this is crying wolf, right? saying that a bad thing happened uh, when it didn't in fact happen. 
And so as this likelihood of crying wolf or uh, you know, claiming a falsely claiming a manipulated election goes up, uh, the marginal cost of manipulation goes down. So if we think about in this framework of legitimacy costs, if polarization between two camps has already depleted the legitimacy of the other side in one camp's view, then when the incumbent is deciding whether or not to engage in election manipulation, they're essentially already paying the legitimacy cost whether they engage in manipulation or not. Right? They've already lost it all, according to the other side, who views them as a threat, who views, views them as unworthy to govern a priori, regardless of the cleanliness of the election. Uh, and so this means that uh, if the incumbent is thinking about this strategically, uh, if the costs are basically the same, if you'll be protested whether you win cleanly or fraudulently, then the benefits start to outweigh the cost and makes manipulation more likely. Uh, and I go through a lot of reasons uh, that are have already been highlighted in the literature about why this might be. Um, you know, viewing the outgroup themselves as a bigger threat to democracy than your own side, um, uh, taking election wins and losses as a more uh, personal victory or defeat in a more polarized setting and so on. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll kind of set this aside, but there are a variety of different reasons that have been cited in, in previous work that lead me to think that this is likely, that we should see more post-election protest in polarized settings, even when election manipulation is, is minimal. Uh, so this leads to two hypotheses. Uh, the first, that election manipulation will be associated with a higher risk of protest in low polarization settings, with that effect decreasing as polarization rises. So to put it another way, when polarization is low, we should see the effect that we typically think that a clean election is more likely to go unprotested and a fraudulent election to be more likely to be protested. But as polarization goes up, we should see that gap narrow and ultimately disappear where protest is happening, whether the election is clean. Hypothesis two, election manipulation will increase as polarization increases because that deterrent effect is going away. To test this, I look at data from, or I combine data from the VDEM project, uh, NELDA, and the electoral contention and violence data set. Putting it all together yields these 1,500 cases, 149 countries, 1990 to 2012. There are two dependent variables in this study. The hypotheses deal with different topics. So one is protest and one is election integrity. Uh, electoral protest I take from that ECAV data set. Uh, and in this paper, it's just a binary measure. Uh, the ECAP data is not binary, it's, it's an event data set. Uh, but for this particular approach, uh, it's, I just consolidate it into protested or not. Uh, and then for the uh, measure of election integrity, I use the broadest measure available from VDEM, which captures multiple dimensions of the electoral process uh, with the understanding that in different countries, the way election integrity is eroded might vary. In some cases, it might be outright fraud. In some cases, it might be ballot access. So just trying to capture everything with this uh, comprehensive measure. The explanatory variable is a measure of affective polarization or attitudes that people have towards each other, uh, also taken from uh, the VDEM data set, specifically looking at political groups and how they view each other. And then the controls are going to vary according to the dependent. Okay, so getting to the results, uh, this is the table of results for um, the models of protest. So again, this is binary, so it's a logit model, and it is a multi-level model uh, with random intercepts by country. So it's trying to accommodate for some of the uh, across-country variation as well as some of the within-country variation. Uh, we'll only talk about model one here because that for the table, because that doesn't have the interaction term. Uh, we just see that, as we would expect, uh, that as election integrity goes down, we see more protest uh, and we see uh, more protest as affective polarization moves up. So it's taking them separately, we see what we would sort of expect to see them separately. Uh, in models two and three, we have an interaction term, which we need to look at graphically. Uh, so turning to uh, this figure that shows us the predicted probability of post-election protest in the data set with uh, the measure of polarization lagged by one year, on the uh, x-axis and uh, predict probability on the y-axis. And then the two lines that we see are the overall level of election integrity. And these two values are the uh, one standard deviation above and below the mean. So it's you know different enough, but not, a, not extreme 
uh, differences. As what we see is this, this predicted behavior that uh, when election integrity is relatively high in the, um, we see the blue line there, in a low polarization setting, we see a pretty low likelihood of a post-election protest. A, a large and statistically significant difference between that and the low uh, election integrity scenario, where the predicted probability of protest is somewhere around 30%. However, as polarization goes up, we see that gap narrowing and ultimately becoming statistically insignificant, where even in clean elections in highly polarized settings, uh, we see this likelihood of uh, post-election protest increasing to match the predicted probability under the uh, fraudulent or more fraudulent, more manipulated condition. Then turning to the second set of models, these are the models of overall election integrity, that VDEM index. These are also multi-level regression models uh, with uh, random intercepts by country. Uh, and what we said, we're not going to talk about model five at this point. That's a, just a separate kind of robustness check for the paper. Uh, so looking at model four, uh, we see that the affective polarization indicator uh, uh, is significantly associated with a decline in, um, in election integrity, as we would expect uh, based on, on this theory. All right, so what, where do we go from here? What does this imply? Um, so in my, in my view, the implication is somewhat significant for our understanding of the de deterrent effect of protest on, on uh, election manipulation. Uh, and the reason for that is, is in this chart here. This is uh, the political polarization measure from VDEM across different world regions over time. And what we see is that in almost every world region, except for Oceania, which is having a great time compared to the other ones, uh, the level of political polarization is either high or high and rising. And so my argument is, thank you, very close to being done, so perfect, uh, that uh, if we are built our theories about the relationship between protest risk and election manipulation on data from the 1990s and the early 2000s, we were looking at a low polarization world where the protest deterrent mechanism perhaps was in operation. Now we're in a period of high polarization in many countries, of course, not everywhere. And so that deterrent effect may not be as functional now in this world as we thought it might have been based on data and, and analysis and theory building from a different world period. And so this means that democracy is likely not self-enforcing, as some have argued, uh, especially when polarization is rising, or at least not fundamentally self-enforcing. We can't rely on the protest, the risk of protest to automatically rise up and, and prevent and punish election manipulation. And instead, uh, practitioners and, and researchers should think about other ways of building institutions that will limit the ability of political principles to get cooperation from election manipulating agents. In particular, I, I argue in the paper, we should think about uh, judicial independence as, as one such mechanism, but we could of course think of, of others. Uh, and so um, the conclusion is, is basically this, that polarization harms democracy, but this paper proposes a novel mechanism, which is that polarization makes political protest after elections more likely, even if the election is clean, breaking the deterrent mechanism, increasing the incentive strategically for incumbents to engage in manipulation. We bear this out with a large data set over the last uh, 20 or so years with some important, I think, theoretical and substantive implications. Uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate uh, your attention, and I look forward to uh, questions and comments. Thank you. That was, again, 15 minutes sharp. So <laughs> you all have been very, very good with the time. And now it's time to hear from our discussant. Manu, the, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. Um, since we only have about four minutes left, I just want to quickly touch upon maybe one uh, one quick point and then maybe give the audience uh, a chance to talk. So Adileke, if uh, you're still here, thank you for your presentation. That was a really good background. I think your paper is still in early stages of development. I would encourage you to think uh, a little bit about uh, being more specific about your methodology. And uh, you have a lot of subjective assessments of uh, 
how you're collecting the data and uh, it, it might be better if you maybe, you know, had semi-structured interviews or if you published preemptively that these are the questions that you might be asking and this is how you do it. Also stating your research question a little bit more explicitly uh, would be helpful. Some of your findings uh, right now seem like conjecture and, uh, you know, if we did the methodology part, you know, in a slightly more structured way, your findings uh, would flow a little bit uh, more naturally from that. Um, game of forms. Uh, so Ronan, Sayed, and Hassan, that was wonderful. When I was reading the paper, it almost felt like I was uh, reading a detective novel that, you know, this happened and that happened and this fraud. And it was just, just so nice to read. So thank you for sharing. Uh, Two things that weren't entirely clear in the paper uh, and maybe other readers would benefit from is maybe a small appendix uh, edition where we have a little bit of uh, objective analysis of the vulnerability of the RMS and the RTS systems and uh, some additional uh, evidence that they have worked well in um, other locations. Uh, something else that wasn't entirely present in the paper, and uh, I don't know if that's your objective, depending on where you'd like to publish it, is uh, some uh, conclusions on uh, policy recommendations, because I read this entire thesis. I, I wasn't entirely sure what your key takeaway was, that uh, is paper good, paper bad, RM is good, bad, like wh where do we go from here? So as the ex maybe that that would be a, a little bit uh, helpful. I'm sorry, I'm rushing through all of these. Uh, Ian, I've I've seen this before. That that's that's just a uh, 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 really cool uh, paper. Uh, one thing that I would have loved to see, and uh, I know you're already working on this, is uh, identifying some common factors, and you already started doing it. So on slide ten. So common factors which the leaders engage in the pre-period, which as an international community, we can look at and see that, okay, I've seen these 10 factors, we've seen these before, we know where this is going. So that kind of, you know, a comparative analysis where we look at the common factors. Um, also, I find some of your exclusion criteria a little bit arbitrary. Because uh, so on page seven, when you have excluded a case for uh, being in civil war, I understand why you've done it. It's it's justified. It's a very transparent choice. But there could be a universe where some cases which have been excluded could be correlated with some aspects of uh, uh, or some choices that the leader has made. Uh, Miguel, that, that paper was just, just fascinating. It is very hard to critique that uh, I read it twice. It's, it's just a really good paper. In fact, you, I mean, the robustness checks are great. Uh, you even had uh, a section on two-way fixed effects and uh, why, you know, we shouldn't blindly trust them. So I have very little uh, to point out my big, uh, not big, minor, minor thing was that the paper rests on perceptions of uh, fairness, but you've again already started addressing that. So that that was my big thing because all of it rests on perception and uh, not maybe as much evidence, but I, I completely buy your point about delays. Uh, Paul, where are my notes? On? Yes, um, I, again, this paper was, lovely it ties a lot into my own research and uh, i definitely buy your claims that uh, election integrity and protest are related uh, i find the writing a little bit convoluted in places where uh, polarization is uh ex you you've explained you've used polarization to uh as as a mediator i think it is more of a confounder here because polarization i think possibly affects protests and election integrity both 
and uh, the way it's presented now, uh, and, and this was a little clearer in your presentation, but your theory section does not tie very well into your hypothesis one. So the way maybe you presented it in uh, the presentation today, it, it would be better, but these are again, very, very minor nitpickings, uh, uh, a little more exploration on how this is a confounder and uh, the theory section is good. Your results are great. I, I like your methodological choices. So not a lot there, but uh, well, this went on long for four minutes. Uh, but uh, thank you all. I, I really enjoyed reading your papers. This was so much work. And uh, I have written comments depending on where you are in the publication stage. Uh, if it's helpful, I can share that with you offline as well. Thank you for sharing. And yes, if the audience have any questions, I'll leave the floor to them. Thank you.